and we're on introducing Jake Seed, co-founder and general partner at Ballistic Ventures, an early stage cybersecurity and security related venture fund. Jake, how are you, man? Thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you on the show. How you been? Good, good. Keeping busy. Uh, obviously, a lot of stuff going on in the world of cyber these days. Absolutely. I um I always try and get a fun fact about somebody before coming on the show. So I was doing my research and did a quick Google. Um, but I actually found that there's a bodybuilder with the same uh, with the same name as you. Have you have you seen him? He's enormous. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some people have asked me, "Is that you?" And unfortunately, that's... it's not. So <laughs> that's the downside of. Uh, you know, uh, somebody who's uh, a bodybuilder is, uh, unfortunately, that's not me. I'm in a lot worse <laughs> shape. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Well, look, Jake, uh, with all my guests, I like to take it right back to, to where it all began and sort of how you got into to the world of VC. Yeah, it, it happened by accident a uh, long, long time ago. Um, you know, I was uh, 24 and... Um, you know, went to uh, an event and uh, there was a partner at a firm called Weiss Peck and Greer Venture Partners who was also at that event. And um, the the world was, uh, you know, going through one of the uh, inflection points uh, back then. It was optical networking, telecommunications uh, bubble, coinciding also with the internet bubble back in uh, 2000. And um, got invited into uh, a venture firm, into Weiss Peck and Greer, um, three months later, we rebranded and relaunched as Lightspeed Venture Partners. So I was the youngest person on the team as a 24-year-old to launch Lightspeed and ultimately spent 11 years there and one of six managing directors on the Global Investment Committee. And incredible journey and opportunity not just be an investor, but a builder of the firm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Did you start as an engineer prior to getting into VC at Cisco? Was that... Well, you know, I, I uh, started as an engineer uh, academically, did my undergrad okay. and master's at MIT and double E and CS. And what I realized is I, I'm very passionate and one of my core values is, you know, how do you do good and do well? How do you use technology to build big businesses, but also to have a big positive impact? And when I talk to people about the idea of what does it take to build great technology that has great impact? Uh, people said, hey, it's not the best technology that wins, but you have to understand the market. And so really for the first job out of college, um, got a product management role at Cisco, right. where I had a chance to understand the market, not just the technology, and uh, went down the product management path right out of college. Yeah. How does how's that helped? Yeah, I, I think that's fundamental to venture capital because, you know, in venture capital, best technology does not win. It, it really, you know, in cybersecurity, it, it's really interesting. People think cybersecurity, very technical, very, almost deep tech, you know, by some standards. Um, but in cybersecurity, if you are brilliant at go to market, you're going to beat somebody who has better technology. Now, obviously, if your technology doesn't work, it doesn't count, right? But, you know, if your technology is good enough and you have exceptional go to market, you will beat the companies that have better technology and, and can't figure out their go to market. And so, you know, really cybersecurity companies, a, a, as much as having a great product that actually protects companies matters, uh, what also matters equally is the ability for that product to insert into the market for you to figure out how to take that product to market. And, um, and that's what you learn a lot about, you know, in in, in the role that I had as, as a product manager, which to be fair, you know, we were a startup group at Cisco. Our, our big idea was broadband back. This is when I was 22. Um, we came up with a standard called DOCSIS, which ultimately became the worldwide standard for high-speed data over cable networks all over the world. Uh, because we were a startup group within Cisco, product management actually meant product marketing and product management rolled into one. Um, so, so that was a, a really formative experience for me, which was, how do you think about getting the product onto the shelf? How do you think about getting it off the shelf? And, um, you know, certainly informs a lot of how I think about, uh, you know, venture and investing as well. Yeah. I love it. So how long did you actually spend at Lightspeed? Was it like 11, 12 years? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So 11 years. And then, you know, have this idea to be the pioneer of a, a pillar of the economy that was just about to move online. And that was real estate. And, you know, it goes back to the value I mentioned, which is 
how do you uh, do good and do well? And and so real estate, multi-trillion dollar TAM, um, had not fully gone online. Zillow and Trulia, which you know today, they were the content side of that equation. Um, my view was what follows uh, is the commerce side after content. And I'd seen this pattern at light speed. And I viewed real estate as being, you know, um, inefficient, not transparent, misaligned interests, and the biggest investment of most people's lives. And the opportunity for the internet to bring efficiency, transparency, alignment of interest to the biggest investment of people's lives. And while Zillow and Trulia were great at bringing content, you know, having a platform that facilitated commerce. So think about in the travel vertical, you know, a trip advisor is the content side, you know, your price line, your booking.com, your hotels.com, that's the commerce side. Every pillar of the economy has that yin and yang between content companies and commerce companies, because fundamentally you have to be good at different things. Mm -hmm. And so I knew what Zillow and Trulia had to be good at was going to be different than what we had to be good at. And ultimately, uh, built auction.com as president, the largest online marketplace for real estate transactions. Uh, we grew it to about $9 billion a year of uh, transactions wow. as president, built every functional area in the business and had 800 people reporting to me. And, you know, th that's important because, you know, here at Ballistic, you know, we focus on cybersecurity, but, you know, we, we really pulled a team together that uh, leverages not just deep investing expertise, but also everybody here has deep operating expertise. And we believe founders value and want people who walked in their shoes. Yeah. You know, um, you, you, you've had a hire, you've had a fire, uh, you had to deal with a board, you've had to deal with investors. I've had to do that. We've all had to do that. And so and that's something we bring over 100 years of operating experience but also uh, actually 40 years of combined venture experience from firms like Lightspeed and Kleiner Perkins. My, my partner, Ted Schlein, ran Kleiner Perkins. Uh, he was there for 30 years. Uh, you know, one of, you know, the top VCs in cybersecurity known, uh, you know, for uh, building exceptional companies in this area. And so uh, we, we thought that marriage of deep expertise in both fields would really differentiate us for the entrepreneur. Yeah, I love it. I think it's 129 years uh, total operating experience, uh, according Who's to your counting? website. <laughs> we, we don't look a day over 128. Uh, so, <laughs> love it. Um, well, it, where, where did the um, when did the inspiration like for ballistic come around then? Because obviously you had something else prior, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I built a solo capitalist platform called Stonebridge. And um, had invested in, in two theme areas, enterprise and migration to the cloud, including a number of cybersecurity companies um, like uh, Cato and Abnormal, Netscope, Drata, Vanta, Veza, Talon. So cyber was a big area for me uh, prior to Ballistic. But, but really, it was Ted Schlein that had the vision for Ballistic and brought us together. Um, he, he knew all of us. Uh, I had known him, gosh, dating back to 2000. And... Um, you know, th there was a question of why now? Why, why is the time now for a cybersecurity fund? And, um, you know, uh, from a venture standpoint, it's really because of the the TAM has grown to the point where, you know, when I was at Lightspeed, if you had a $500 million exit in cyber, that was big. Now you could have a $50 billion exit in cyber. And that justifies an independent focus fund on this opportunity, this problem set, and, and it's only getting bigger. And, and why is it only getting bigger? Because there's a hundred trillion dollar global economy, and every day more of that, more and more of that goes over digital surfaces. And when more and more of it goes over digital surfaces, it gets exposed to risk, to fraud, um, to IP theft, and, and so it really becomes existential to our way of life, right? You can't live your life online uh, if, and we live our lives more and more online if cybersecurity doesn't work. But we also now see we can't live our life offline if cybersecurity doesn't work. You can't go to the hospital, can't get gas. Look at the MGM breach. You can't even get into your hotel room because now the doors are connected to, you know, the internet. And so, you know, criminals can shut down your door lock and now you're stuck. And so, uh, again, that's just starting. You know, we all know we're, moving into a self-driving car world. Well, imagine there's a major car brand and hackers drive, you know, tragically 10 people into walls uh, in a day. How many cars of that car brand get sold the next day? 
I'll tell you, zero cars yeah, yeah, get yeah. sold the next day. And that's becomes now existential to the CEO, to the board, to shareholders, you know, and of course the tragedy that would happen, you know, for, for people in those cars. Um, and, and so this idea that cyber is now existential is created the need we think for a dedicated fund. And there's something about cyber that's so different than other every other area of venture, which is the adversary. The adversary in cyber drives a lot of innovation. You know, they they are entrepreneurs. They use new technology. They're using you know generative AI and uh, GPTs, right, to now make their tax more sophisticated. And so, as the adversary evolves new threats. That, that creates opportunity for entrepreneurs on this side of the table to come up with solutions. And, and that's unlike any other area of venture capital investing. You don't have that if you're funding consumer internet companies, of course, but you don't have that an adversary for funding business apps. When you're funding other areas in venture capital and in enterprise infrastructure, you're looking at general changes in infrastructure, general changes in architectures. You don't have to focus on the adversary. And so, you know, our experience with the adversary, given our backgrounds investing in the space, given what we do inside of work and outside of work, we think lets us be closer to where the next innovation is needed and support entrepreneurs who are focused on that next innovation. Yeah, fa fascinating space. I'm absolutely in, in love with it. What about, so Ballistic, when you're actually, uh, what, what you're, in terms of your investment thesis, what are you actually looking for? Because how early are we going is this yeah so we raised 300 million to focus on early stage investing and and for us we invest in series a we invest in seed round we invest in pre-seed we do incubations mm -hmm. once we do our initial investment we support a company through their life um so it's really the focus of the initial investment is at that early stage and ultimately you know we want to fund entrepreneurs and companies looking to solve the biggest problems in cybersecurity. And so um, from a financial metric standpoint, that implies companies that can be standalone public companies. A lot of companies ultimately won't make it there. They'll get acquired. Um, some, you know, unfortunately won't make it at all and, and will go out of business. But we have to have an investment thesis that the market opportunity is big enough to create a standalone independent public company. Yeah, absolutely. I obviously saw you had your first exit as well with uh, with Talon. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, Science that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, fortunate. Um, you know, uh, that was the uh, largest venture backed cybersecurity exit of 2023. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it goes back to, you know, this thesis of companies that can be very valuable, very strategic, right? It's not just a, a, a new, you know, feature, but really something that can be foundational. And, and, and Talon, of course, was what we, and, and of course, the entrepreneurs envision as the next evolution of a CrowdStrike. Ultimately, in a cloud and SaaS world, the browser is your operating system. And if it's your operating system, it offers you the most security possible in endpoint protection. And it could actually offer you that security across both managed and unmanaged devices, which traditional endpoint security only focuses on managed devices. So our, our view is there was a chance to, to, be, uh, to build a very strategic and important company with that. And Palo Alto certainly recognized that and, and approached the company, um, you know, early in their life. Yeah, amazing. So I know why you've invested in Talon because Offer and the team there are, are great. But when you're yeah. making your investments, like cause I, I've interviewed Offer before, um, when, when you're making your investments, Jake, like what, what do you specifically look for? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, beyond can this be a large independent public company given the TAM, it's it's of course the team. And you know, you have great founders who are repeat founders uh, like uh, uh, Ofer. Mm. Um, but, you know, there there are many great founders who are first-time founders also. And, um, you know, I've backed first-time founders who've built large and important companies. Um, you know, uh, outside of cyber was an early investor in Zipline, uh, Keller, you know, first-time mm. CEO. And, uh, you know, that company is transforming logistics and, you know, will do what uh, Amazon Prime Air promised, but Zipline is actually delivering it. Delivering it. Um, the founders of Off-Chain Labs, they were cybersecurity uh, researchers, uh, PhD students, professor out of Princeton. 
that had an insight into how to make uh, Ethereum more scalable while ensuring it's more secure. And you know their uh, token currently trades at a 15 billion market cap on the uh, exchanges. Um, so and, and they were first time entrepreneurs, first time CEO. And, and so you know, like what, what what do you look for if if you back second time founders, first time founders? You know, it comes down to a couple things. One is, you know, um, do you have an insight into this large potential opportunity that's differentiated? Two, you know, are you an entrepreneur where you believe as an investor you can build around that person? Nobody has all the skills day one as a founder, right? You know, everybody has areas they're good at, areas they need to complement themselves in. And so if you have a founder who really is self-aware about where they need to complement themselves and can really be exceptional about team building, recruiting people who have no right being at that company, they're like, you know what? I need to work with that person. I need to work, you know, on this mission. I need to work. I need to be part of this journey early on. You know, that's where first time founders, you know, can really differentiate themselves as being excellent recruiters, excellent team builders. And so we try to get a sense of that. And, and then, of course, you know, um, if you have a solution that has a large TAM, you believe there's a, a team that you could really build around um, or, or maybe has a more experienced skill set, um, th then we believe that that's those are the types of investments that you make as an early stage fund. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of as what why would founders uh, specifically fundraise with Ballistic over well, there's obviously lots of other potential options, specifically as to Ballistic, why why would they consider fundraising with you guys? Yeah, I, I think something that's different about us is because we're focused on cybersecurity, you get the whole partnership. You know, typically generalist firms they, they do great work. But, you know, you'll have one or two partners who will invest in cybersecurity. And across one of the two of those partners, maybe 25% of what those one or two people do is cyber, 75%, 60%, whatever, the majority is not cyber. Here you have five senior founders. All day, every day, five people talk to customers that matter, talent that matters, partners that matter. We have a portfolio selling into the cybersecurity ecosystem Everybody helps everybody. And that's very unique. 100% of five people versus 25% of two people, you get a very, very different level of engagement. Um, we're a small fund in the sense that we're going to have 20 investments per fund. We have 17 investments now. Uh, so, you know, we don't have hundreds of portfolio companies. We're not on dozens of boards. And so I'd say it's a throwback model. It's a throwback model to... You know, the 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 kind of old, you know, craftsmanship model of venture where you had small funds, senior partners, all partners have run companies, uh, again, walked in the entrepreneur's shoes and um, worked diligently for companies to help create value from the early stages. Yeah, I love it. You've also got um, an advisory board of just absolute heavyweight titans. I um, I met with Chris Inglés in New York City last week. Great guy. Um, and I was just looking at some of the advisors on your board that that support your portfolio companies. How how did you get all of them on board? <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, th that's also part of the power of focus, right? You know, um, every venture firm has an advisory board. But, you know, again, you know, for, for a generalist firm, they have to divide that advisory board amongst the 15 different areas that they invest in. So for us, you know, even though we're not the biggest venture fund, we have the biggest, deepest advisory board for a cyber entrepreneur because, again, you know, we're, we're undiluted in our focus and our effort. And these advisors are not working with us just because they want to, you know, invest in some portfolio companies. As you know, in cybersecurity, there's a real mission, right? There's a, a mission to, to, to do good. And so I think there's a lot of mission alignment between the 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 very best leaders in the cybersecurity industry and you know them seeing what we're doing and wanting to be a part of it not just for economic reasons but you know for for uh deeper you know mission alignment reasons mm. 
For any founders that are listening to this and are, are interested in fundraising with Ballistic, are there any like common mistakes that founders maybe come to you that they typically make and any practical advice that you can give for, for founders looking to fundraise? Yeah, so, you know, on fundraising, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, I, I would say for cybersecurity founders, you know, the number one thing is, there's a lot of focus on product and technology, a lot less focus on how that translates into low friction go to market. And low friction go to market means that you have to start really thinking hard about your market segments, your personas, your economic buyer, your compelling event, um, who are the influencers and how you insert in, into all of that. And so I'd say that's the number one thing for early stage cyber entrepreneurs you know, think about, you know, not just the product and technology, but the go to market piece. Yeah, nice. We um, are just back from New York and there was a lot of talk. We, we held a VC lunch and there was a lot of talk, of course, about Gen AI still and the security around it. Um, but also OT security kept popping up. Um, what what are you specifically uh, seeing and do you expect to see for, for 2024? Yeah, we, we have an investment in the OT, IoT security space, Perigee. Mm -hmm. Um you know, th this is obviously an area of critical importance. Obviously, Chris Ray uh, from the FBI was, you know, uh, widely, uh, you know, broadcast about, you know, some of the challenges there. Um, but but again, this is this is just one surface of many. You think about, you know, in, in our life now, every piece of our life is on a digital surface. And, and again, it's, you know, now our, our dishwasher connects to the Internet. <laughs> Our car connects to the internet. Uh, you know, our water bottle connects to the internet. And, and so, um, you know, critical infrastructure poses, you know, its own unique challenges. Uh, OT uh, poses its own unique challenges. But but I'd say, you know, it's so important to that, that we think holistically about our attack surfaces. And, and, you know, a really important area that people don't often talk about um, and that will be the hardest to uh, to, to address. The, the, the most vulnerable attack surface is the human attack surface, is the human surface, right? As humans, the nature of what we do when we go about our life, we go about doing our jobs, the best attackers will utilize what we naturally do to create compromise. And, and so I think that's kind of one of the greatest challenges of our time is, you know, how, how do we harden that surface? And, and there's no easy answer at this point. Yeah, yeah. What's the future for uh, for Ballistic Ventures, Drake? Yeah, you know, uh, we're, we're off to the races. Um, you know, we're excited about our portfolio. We're very actively investing in uh, new early stage companies, um, both, uh, you know, we're U.S. focused, uh, but also invest internationally, Israel, Canada. We've looked at European and uh, deals uh, out of India as well. And so, you know, for, for entrepreneurs looking to tackle large problems, um, you know, give us a call. Great. Absolute pleasure to have you on and uh, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed today's show, please like and share with your friends and colleagues as this is really important for the show's reach. If you'd like to be our next guest or are interested in Aspron Search's staffing solutions, please get in touch directly with me or reach out to us via our website, www.aspronsearch.com.